Good morning. My name is Kristen Philipson, and I welcome you to this Good Friday service at Rosedale United Church in Toronto. We call this day good in the sense that it's a holy day, a day set apart in the same way we would call the, the Bible the good book. This is a service, though, that feels much like a Remembrance Day service. It's more contemplative, more subdued, more somber. Today, we are invited to remember Jesus' crucifixion. Through music and scripture, we'll pause to reflect, to lament Jesus' death, and to lament the persistence of injustice and suffering worldwide. This year, suffering may feel very immediate to each of us. After a time of prayer to center ourselves, and an opening reading from scripture, the service will progress through six movements. Each movement begins with a piece of music and a lifting of some of Jesus' last words. You'll then hear a brief personal lament from people within our congregation who have been on the front lines of the pandemic this year. A healthcare worker, a chaplain, a teacher, a student, mental health advocates, survivors of COVID, and those who are grieving loss. After each of these brief reflections, we'll extinguish one of our tenebrae candles and lift up an assurance of grace using the poetry of the United Church of Canada's most recent statement of faith, a song of faith. And so we gather in the thoughtfulness and quiet, in the sadness of this year, and even here, find love. In the life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. And so I light now our tenebrae candles. Roberta will lead us in our centering prayer. A moment of prayer. Eternal God, may this sacred time evoke in us a deep sense of awe. Even in our heartache, may we feel your everlasting love. In faith, we join once more in praying with Jesus the prayer he taught saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Then the local authorities took Jesus to Pilate's headquarters, who had summoned Jesus and had asked him, Are you the king of the people? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. After he had said this, Pilate went out to the people again and told them, I find no case against him. Do you want me to release for you this king? The people shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King! and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. When the local authorities and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the people cried out, If you release this man, you are a no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement. He said to the people, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The local authorities answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. reading from Luke, chapter 23, 33 to 34. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The words of Christ heard today in our regret and longing. Hi there, my name is Young In Kim. I'm a member at uh, Rosedale United Church. Uh, I'm a gastroenterologist at St. Michael's Hospital and a professor of medicine at University of Toronto. I have four children uh, who all went through Rosedale United Church Sunday school. And I think my wife's too pretty active at the church. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, really long for the days that we didn't have this pandemic, we wish that we had better preparation for this type of outbreaks. But now we have this, you know, we uh, long for a better treatment and also uh, uh, really uh, vaccination for everybody, especially for young folks. And uh, I really feel 
bad for the uh, young people who lost uh, you know significant portion of their lives mm -hmm. so i really uh, long for uh, the early deployment and uh, general vaccination for the whole uh, population especially young folks mm -hmm. and for personally you know uh, i really long for being able to work with my colleagues without ppes and face mask and mask and you know having to uh, having to uh, being able to socialize uh, you know my colleagues after work and touching you know uh, handshakes and hugging and things like that work i miss those and um, yeah this is really unusual time as we extinguish a candle we hear these words of grace and let them rest upon our hearts Yet, evil does not, cannot, undermine or overcome the love of God. God forgives and calls us to repent the part that we have played in damaging our world, ourselves, and each other. God transforms and calls us to protect the vulnerable, to pray for deliverance from evil, to work with God for the healing of the world that all might have abundant life. We sing of grace. verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The words of Christ for all who hold fast to the promises of faith through trying times. 
Uh, so Jim Harbell, and I'm a, a chaplain at Scarborough Health Network. My faith was uh, challenged um, through one particular episode. Uh, as part of the hospital work, the hospital was running a long-term care facility, and I was asked to go in and provide trauma counseling to the staff. Uh, in this long-term care facility, 66 people died there last spring, uh, and one staff person, uh, all in the period of about five weeks. Uh, so the hospital realized about six weeks later that this staff really, really needed help. And listening to the stories of seven people dying on a Sunday afternoon and a room where they had um, framed photos of all of the people who had died laid out on these two massive tables uh, to hold 66 photos and the staff person, it just, uh, it was shocking. And I understand why it was so traumatic for staff. And uh, you, you had to ask the question, where was God in all of this? I think that um, I started to fully appreciate what lament meant that um, it was important to sit in a room with the staff and, and I did it for hours and hours in groups and in individuals and simply to let them cry and to sit in silence and to let them go pick up a picture and to talk about the person and to understand that this lament was from their perspective for members of their family. Some of these folks in a long-term care facility have had a staff relationship that goes for 10 or 15 years, or in the case of one woman that died, she had been in this home for 35 years. So there was, lament was so important as simply being, not, not in any way trying to other, other than to be, you couldn't really offer any help. Like you couldn't, um, and that was okay. They just needed to be with somebody and to tell their story. In and with God, we can direct our lives towards right relationship with each other and with God. We can discover our place as one strand in the web of life. We can grow in wisdom and compassion. We can recognize all people as kin. We can accept our mortality and finitude, not as a curse, but as a challenge to make our lives and choices matter.
from John 19, 26 to 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took him, took her into his own home. The words of Christ, a recognition of the care and compassion that meet us, even in our grief and loss. Uh, when Lily died, I remember sending a note to friends talking about the death, her death, and saying that I trusted the process of grief. And I have spent really all of my career uh, working with people who were dying and grieving. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of loss, but this year tops, really, um, losses. And I guess the most important thing I can say is that when I said I trusted grief, living through the grief now, which is certainly not over, and I will have grief around Lily's death my entire life and the devastation it has caused in my family, um, but I trust it even more. After Lily died, which was two weeks after Joy, George Floyd's murder, and I, it was in the news a lot, and I started to just realize that all these black young men who die at the hands of gang violence, police violence, it happens in our city all the time. For a lot of years, I have somehow been able to tell myself that's not my community. Mm -hmm. Not consciously, but you know, if those deaths had been happening to children and young people who were in our Rosedale community, we would all be devastated. Mm -hmm. So what I realized was, with my grief around Lily, that the mothers and the grandmothers, I mean, I'm thinking about that, those two little girls who were shot playing in a park. Mm -hmm. It's never occurred to me when I take my granddaughter to a park that it could be an unsafe place because I take her to parks that are in those communities. But I started to realize that the grief, the enormous grief in those communities of mothers and grandmothers, not just grandmothers and mothers, but the, the whole community. Um, and as I am getting more into the literature around Black Lives Matter and hearing the stories of grief um, and the grief that we have caused Black, Indigenous and people of color because of our ignorance and our privilege. The hard thing for us is, and this is where the story gets tough, Jesus, of course, does go to the cross and uh, says, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that's really important for us to hear because who of us, I don't think we can do this hard work without going to that place of feeling utterly forsaken by the divine. Mm -hmm. And we can feel forsaken by everybody else too. Um, the story tells us that he goes to hell for three days. And we always want to go right from Good Friday to Easter Sunday and have the resurrection. But, you know, hell lasts a long time. And this year has been hell for a lot of people. It's been hell for me many times. But I don't stay there because I'm able to know that I won't stay there. If I go there, I don't stay there. If I go there, it's like the caterpillar in the chrysalis. And I know it's a, a well-worn metaphor but we can't open that chrysalis too soon or we kill the butterfly. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to trust the process to stay there long enough that the new life emerges. And I do feel that um, that's happened to me over and over and over again this year. And I think it'll, you know, just keep happening actually. We sing of the Spirit, who speaks our prayers and deepest longing and enfolds our concerns and confessions, transforming us and the world.
From Mark chapter 15, verse 34. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words of Christ, a cry today from all 
who feel alone in their suffering and hardship. Hi, this is Linda. And Claude. And nice Speaking to you from Don Mills. <laughs> it was something that is unbelievable. Uh, you, the fear of not getting through it was, I guess, the worst part of it. And uh, especially since um, we were separated at the hospital and um, I couldn't get a hold of him anymore once I was released and he had to stay in. And uh, that was extremely frightening. So uh, they triaged me, because I, I was the actual the patient, they triaged me into emergency and Linda into the COVID lineup. So she did like outpatient. And uh, when I was in the emergency, the emergency was nobody there because okay, COVID was. And first doctor comes in and says, how much do you want me to do to keep you going? Mm -hmm. So that kind of, if you think of it, I felt alone because I didn't have the phone. I took out of communication. You're so used to having the phone that when you don't have one, it's terrible. It was in bed. And I, and I was like at a semi-private room, but just the one bed in it. So that was, but it was at night. Like I'm sleep, trying to go to sleep and you're hearing the doctors and nurses talking in the hallway. And a lot of times they don't really use a lot of common sense, especially at shift change. You're hearing about, well, this is what this patient has. This is what this patient has to the new shift coming in. And then somebody says, well, how about Mrs. Smith? Well, she didn't make it. And you're a patient and like, yeah, and I'm sure like three or four patients would hear that. You know, like, it's, so you really feel alone. Last year on my birthday, which was April 5th, um, I was so sick in bed, uh, couldn't even, uh, you know, totally nauseous and fever and everything. And he was in the hospital. So I have to think that that was probably the worst birthday ever. The fullness of life includes moments of unexpected inspiration and courage lived out, experiences of beauty, truth, and goodness, blessings of seeds and harvest, friendship and family, intellect and sexuality, the reconciliation of persons through justice, and communities living in righteousness, and the articulation of meaning. John 19, verse 28. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. The words of Christ heard today 
in all who long to be refreshed and relieved of pain. Hi, I'm Marilyn McKelvey. I'm a high school teacher in the North Toronto area. And teaching high school students during this year of COVID has been really challenging for the students. These young people are at a stage in their lives when they should be able to get out and explore, experience new ideas, events, and each other. Instead, they've been restricted with rolling lockdowns, sometimes imposed by government, sometimes by very cautious parents, sometimes in a couple of rare cases in my situation, because they caught that terrible virus themselves. The high school where I teach usually has about 1,800 students and a huge range of extracurricular activities, sports teams, clubs, special events, field trips, and a prom for the grads. So much has had to be canceled. I worry about that student who doesn't have a mic on their, on their computer when I try to reach them online, that student whose Wi-Fi keeps disconnecting, who doesn't understand the lesson, is unhappy, hungry, but I can't see their body language to realize that they're struggling. Our youth is being deprived and they deserve our empathy. Some will be okay when they return to a bricks and mortar school when the pandemic ends. They have become closer to their family. They've had great tech support, but then there'll be others who have been trapped in homes with unhappy people. They've lost valuable time in what could have been a budding sports career or an academic success. Let's hope that the youth can get vaccinated by September and that our schools can return to normal. Okay, I am uh, Liam Berry and I'm in grade 10. Um, so we recently put a bench up on the Sunnybrook Fields just right by my house in memory of my grandfather who spent a lot of time there. And um, oftentimes after school, I would go up there and just sit um, and kind of, it would, I, you know, usually in the summer they're, um, they're playing fields for sports, but in winter there's rarely anyone up there. So it would be me by myself kind of in solitude <laughs> and I would have these moments of reflection where I could just sit there and feel the presence of my grandfather and then also just experience the therapeutic benefits of nature as well. And um, like either watch the snow fall or, um, watch the branches kind of um, blow in the wind too. I don't know, it was, yeah, it was very therapeutic for me and I'm very thankful that I had that. <laughs> um, so yeah. In terms of mental health, I had a lot of my friends come to me and kind of um, express their struggles. And I think I've, I've struggled with mental health um, quite a bit throughout the last, however, it was 10 years. Um, and I think I was an overly empathetic to others because I was, I was, I think I was ignorant and unaware that others may be going through the same thing. And I think that that kind of, um, yeah, that made me more empathetic and having people come and open up to me. Hi, my name is Sarah Campbell. I work with medically fragile children and, um, it was intense in the beginning, just having to learn the new normal in regards to all the PPE. You know, there's, there's types of masks and, and shields and, and then fluctuating between face shields and goggles and safety glasses to prevent headaches or whatever, gowns, gloves. Yeah, I would say at the beginning, like everyone, um, because there were so many unknowns. Um, for instance, if somebody coughed, um, I'd be like jetting backwards, 30 feet. Not really, but you know, and then going, oh, why am I doing that? I don't wanna offend anyone. Um, but there was fear, there was shoulders up by my ears. There was, uh, you're in a state of constant alert, which is a little exhausting. Um, I'm fine with the PPE. I mean, I've learned how to sort of manipulate it, but at the beginning, I definitely had to open the window and take breathing breaks. Um, that's all cool now. I've learned to work it. Um, I would say sometimes uh, there's been breaking points where we can't do what we used to do. Um, there's all these extra steps. 
added to the job. Um, so having to let go of the many things we used to do um, and finding a new normal to provide quality of life for these lovely individuals. And just sometimes a lot of events happening at the same time. What do you do first with all these limitations? Through word, music, art, and sacrament, in community and in solitude, God changes our lives, our relationship, and our world. We sing with trust. John 19, verse 30. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The words of Christ, and in them an echo of our release of control. Sure, my name is Victoria Turner, and I have three children ages 11, 14, and 15. I think. My breaking points um, came when I felt like I had no influence or control over my kids and their choices. And I, in retrospect, realized how busy our children are with homework activities, typically seeing friends a full life and all of those things off of their schedules. It was daunting and overwhelming took it quite personally that my children weren't able to figure out what else to do with their time and technology became this huge focus and this huge trigger uh, and point of frustration and often the catalyst for when it felt like I just was out of control. I wanted to give up or breaking point. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Shauna Massey and uh, I am, I work at the George Hall Center, which is a children's mental health center, and we work with kids from birth all the way through to age 18 and their families. I've been most worried about youth, um, and I see that both from where I work, because we work with so many youth, obviously, and also with my own kids and their, their peers. Um, this, what they're going through is the total opposite of where, where they're meant to be developmentally, um, they are meant to be out exploring and experiencing and trying new things, not meant to be at home, stuck with their parents in their rooms and not doing any of that. Um, you know, a year for us at our age is, it's not so huge, but a year for the youth, that's a big piece of their whole life right there and they can't get it back. So that's, it, it would be the youth for me. Hi, my name is Julian. I use they, them pronouns. Um, my mental health has been and is currently still most challenged when I observe negligence in the community for um, health regulations, for community care, for each other. <laughs> um, and it's really easy for me to isolate and distance myself uh, when my fight or flight response is initiated, um, having a fiance who is immunocompromised has really made me 
hyper aware of the people around me and the seriousness of the virus and whether or not the people around me are taking precautions. Um, my anxiety has definitely worsened throughout the pandemic um, and coming out of the pandemic, I will definitely need new tools to navigate the world that I don't know if I have, um, but it's something that I'm gonna have to learn for sure. <laughs> um, spring is also like bringing a difficult turmoil that's very challenging because um, spring is new life, it's Easter, it's beautiful. We have the rollout of the vaccine, which is overjoyous, overjoyed. I'm overjoyed about it and it's cause for celebration. Um, but it also worries me because I'm worried that the more people that get the vaccine will also see an increase in recklessness. And then comes this um, cycle of observing negligence and isolating myself um, that I that I worry about. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so Perfect. that's the challenge for sure. And so we sing of God the Spirit, whom from the beginning has swept over the face of creation, animating all energy and matter, and moving in the human heart. We sing of God the Spirit, faithful and untamable, who is creatively and redemptively active in the world. Luke 23, verse 46. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Divine creation does not cease until all things have found wholeness, union, and integration with the common ground of all being. As children of the timeless one, our time-bound lives will find completion in, all, in the all-embracing creator. In the meantime, we embrace the present, embodying hope, loving our enemies, caring for the earth choosing life. Wenn ich einmal soll scheiden, so scheide nicht von mir. Wenn ich den Tod soll leiden, so Oh. 